um, he, he came to me last second and he's like, man, I didn't book a room. And I was like, no problem. I've, I've got a room. It's a double bed and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, two beds. So we're good, you know? And, uh, so we, we, we get to San Francisco and I go to check in the room and I get the key and I go up to the room and the room is like really, really small. Like if you wanted to do push ups or sit ups in the floor, like you'd almost have no room. It's very, oh, wow. very small. And there's one queen size bed. Oh <laughs> so, my God. <laughs> Yeah, so I knew. Okay, this is this is a little bit of a, an issue. So it's, we're we're close friends, but we're not that close. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I went back down to the uh, to the front desk and I, I I said, "Hey, is there any way we can get a, a double bed?" I thought that was my reservation. They're like, "Oh, the hotel's sold out." And, wow. Um, <laughs> so what is there a way to get a roller bed or a, a cot? Or and they're like, "No, it's not going to fit in the floor." And I knew they were oh, right. Oh my god. It's really small. So then uh, I'm just really uh, concerned here. I'm like, how's this going to play out? So I asked for extra bedding, thinking, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to sleep on the floor. We're not going to share a blanket. <laughs> yeah, we're, well, and I texted my wife. I'm like, I texted her a picture of the bed, and she sent me back this gif of two spoons, like spoons. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. Uh, even, even my wife is, like, not supporting me in this one. Yeah. So uh, long story short, um, I went to lunch, and I came back. And there was a, a Filipino lady that was working the desk to this gentleman who had worked before he was, uh, he had moved on, I guess. So he was off shifts. And, uh, so I, I went and asked the lady, I was like, is there any way to switch this? Cause you know, this is going to be a, a challenging evening. <laughs> if there's, if there's no or alternative. A great evening. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I really, I was, I was trying to look out more for my friend. I was, I was I like to think that I was open, but anyway, <laughs> Long story short, she said uh, that someone had just called and canceled the uh, their double bed room, and oh. she's like, "I'll just move you over to that one." So crisis oh, sweet. Was averted. Uh, yeah, we, we both had our own beds, and uh, yeah, it all kind of <laughs> out. But, uh, so th th these are little things that happen oh, daily. Funny. Like, uh, you, you mentally, you were you were just running through this vi <laughs> visualizing. Okay. All right. So uh, who takes the left, who takes the right? And, and, yeah, and, like... exactly. <laughs> well, and I, and I and keep in mind, I mean, nothing against, uh, in, in no way is this a, 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 a remark against San Francisco, but in San Francisco, <laughs> the, the, the manager of the hotel, he, he, he actually said this to me. I explained to him, I was like, well, you know, we needed two separate breads. And he said, I don't understand the problem. <laughs> I was like, okay, hold on. All right. We're married, but we're, we're not married to each other. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah. He's like, so, you should like, don't question our relationship. Right? <laughs> right. So that was, that was kind of fun too. It was like, I'm for, oh, forgetting classic. what city I'm in. I have to explain. Uh, yeah. Uh, San uh, no, classic. we're, you know, no, we, we do need separate beds if we can. And uh, so it, uh, it all worked out anyway. Well, it's nice to know you're, you're not above uh, sharing a bed. You know what I mean? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, if it came down to it, uh, you know, I was preparing for whatever scenario needed to happen. I probably yeah. would have, Figured out the floor. Problem solver right there. <laughs> do what you got to do. So. Yeah, 100%. There's nothing like a bit of heat. It's hard to bother you with that story. I just uh, <laughs> No, a lovely story. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an, a random one, but it's, a, it's an example of <laughs> some of the crazy things that come up day to day. Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, those yeah. are nice problems. Cool stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Jared Easley. Thank you so much, buddy, for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. I'm honored to be here. I don't feel worthy of being on this show, but I'm here anyway. Thanks again for lowering your standards to invite me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> but, oh, please. Uh, yeah, that's, that's so untrue. If, if ever I've heard it, you are, you're <laughs> the main man behind podcast movements and it is absolutely like an honor to have you on our podcast. And, you know, that's basically the biggest and best podcast con podcast conference in the world for people's information so and we were fortunate enough to go there last year and literally were blown away and we just totally just totally loved it so I just wanted to say thank you so much for putting on such an incredible event um, and you've obviously just uh, finished podcast movement 2019 basically fresh of the boat how did it go bud uh, it was awesome. I mean, Philadelphia was had its own special moments. And so to compare the two, it's kind of like, you know, you know, comparing which child you love the most as mm. a parent. But um, yeah, the Orlando was a great event. It, it definitely had grown. Um, we've grown each year, which is always uh, just so encouraging to see uh, the growth in podcasting as an industry overall. And that translates also to the events that we do. 
And so uh, both in sponsors, exhibitors and attendees. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was, a, it was a great event, a amazing venue. Uh, I know the time frame for some people thinking August in Orlando, Florida, that might not be the best place to be, but um, we spent a majority of the time inside. They have this thing called air conditioning. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was a really uh, great event and, the feedback overwhelmingly was positive. And there's always a couple of things that you learn as you do this uh, to consider how do I incorporate some of these new ideas and some of these uh, suggestions for next year. And so, you know, I think as long as we are attentive to that and continue to put our best foot forward, we'll hopefully continue to improve the event each time we do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, geez, it was amazing when we went and we've heard great things as well. We had a few friends who went mm -hmm. this year, so um, it sounds like it was incredible. And just like this amazing like learning experience, you know, because of the industry's changing sort of so quickly in, in one regards. And it's, um, you know, it's nice to kind of be sort of kept up to date with all this fresh information. Um, so well, what did you did you have any like major takeaways or, or great stories yourself? Like, <laughs> I wish that I did. I, I a lot of the roles and, and the different hats that I'm wearing during the event is unfortunately not the uh, attendee hat. So I, I don't always get to sit in on the sessions and get to uh, enjoy all this wisdom. So I, I try to go back and, and review the virtual ticket. Um, but being able to see some people from literally all over the world, we had over 30 countries represented and, um, and about uh, close to 3,000 attendees. We had, we had 3,000 registered, but less than that actually showed up as probably about 2,800, but, uh, which is still amazing. And, wow. and uh, yeah, I mean, those things are, are mind blowing. And to see uh, people from, you know, different, uh, different backgrounds and, and different categories coming together and learning from each other and, uh, it's just a really collaborative, uh, an awesome collaborative spirit and synergistic uh, event, as you know, as you've seen in, in, in Philadelphia, that was just, uh, you know, continued in Orlando. So I, I think the thing for me, the, the takeaway is, is that podcasting continues to grow. More and more people are interested in um, getting into it. More and more pe people are interested that already have a show in doing it as the best that they can to uh, put it and leverage it the best way possible and, and, you know, based on their goals and, and wanting to increase the visibility. And so it's just such an encouraging uh, place for podcasters right now is um, you can come to an event like podcast movement. If you're an independent or you're a hobbyist podcaster and you can meet the people from Pandora and iTunes and, or mm. Apple, excuse me, and, and Google and iHeartRadio and, um, Spotify, all those people are there. They want to meet you. And if they do meet you, it puts you in a position where down the road when they're doing spotlights and stuff, they say, Hey, we should, you know, hook up the ridiculously human podcast. And, <laughs> and, and so we've seen that time and time again, where, where people come and connect with uh, folks that are, you know, have platforms that can feature shows and, and it creates an opportunity for a show that might not get that opportunity uh, to, mm. to, you know, be up there front and center with some of the bigger podcasts out there. And, uh, that's just one of many reasons why podcast movement is great. And, and so, yeah, it was a great event. Um, yeah. I just I really enjoyed seeing so many friends and meeting new ones. Mm -hmm. Well, you made a good point there is like, it feels like mm -hmm. coming home when you, when we were there and we were quite disappointed we couldn't go this year um, for yeah. that feeling, you know, just in terms of the community that you're creating there is like you come in there, everyone is super supportive. We're all in the same boat and, you know, the fact that you're creating this tribe and community is, um, is very special because it, it is, you're creating the common bonds between people and, uh, yeah, it just feels very like a safe space there and, and, a, and a happy vibe, you know, so, so great job, man. You've done a really epic um, job with it. Oh, one lady was telling me she has a, a bird watching podcast and mm -hmm. I asked her, I was like, what, what was a, a session that was, you know, meant had some meaning to you or that you've, you know, found value in and, and her answer kind of made me laugh. She was like, uh, I loved, you know, this one and this one, the ones that would be obvious to me. And then she's like, but the one that really stood out to me was the, the wrestler guys, you know, they were awesome. They had all these ideas that I never thought of. I'm like, I, I just thought about that for a minute. A, a woman who podcasts about bird watching is getting creative ideas from the wrestler podcast. Love it. <laughs> um, and that, and that's, isn't that the way it should be? You know, we have, yeah so many different circles in podcasting and when you get them all together and they talk about, well, what's working for you, you're bound to find out, okay, this one person that talks about dogs is, 
got an idea that the mortgage guy didn't think about or whatever. Totally. There's so many different podcasts out there <laughs> and uh, really fun to see those different circles uh, come mm-hmm. together and ideas shared. And then next thing you know, somebody's walking away with a, a great idea that they wouldn't have gotten had they not listened to the wrestlers talk about, totally. <laughs> uh, which is random, but, but I love that. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but you know what, I think that is that exactly, Craig, it's that cross-pollination. And you know what, this doesn't happen enough like in business. So if you go to like a, a business conference, it's all about, say, accounting or whatever. But it's, a business conference should be like about, you know, say, accounting and tech and art and what all these things. And there's so much to learn from each industry that we can actually bring into our own. And, but that's not actually done enough. So uh, you're doing it in such a great way, bud. So, so um, congratulations for that, my man. And um but getting back to you, but uh, you you have like this really really great story, and uh, you're from Alabama. And yes. just, every time I hear Alabama, I just want to sing the song. <laughs> oh, <Home>, Alabama! <laughs> as, as you should, as, yes. as you should. But well, I'm glad you you don't, you don't feel like you know this guy's crazy. <laughs> um, uh, probably you've never heard that one before. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I, I love it. I, if I had my guitar, we'd sing it together right now. Okay, but, but, but that that being said, uh, you know I know Birmingham's in England, and and um, one time when I was in high school, I went to see the the band Bush which, you know, they had their moment in the spotlight there, you know, many years ago. Mm. And they did a tour in the U.S. They came to Birmingham. That was where all the, the moderately large bands would come and perform in the state of Alabama and be Birmingham. And so they were talking about how they were from Birmingham, but from Birmingham, England, or that they were from mm. close there or something like that. Um, and so, you know, I've always felt this, uh, you know, like I have some kind of uh, kindred spirit with people from, from Birmingham, England. And uh, an uncommon known fact, uh, there are, not a lot of people know this about me, but there was a season of my life for several months where I lived in the UK ah, and not everybody mm. knows that. And so I lived in Slough. I so know. Let, let the record reflect that. Yes, I did. I did live <laughs> in Slough. And, um, you know, people who know about Slough can <laughs> take that for whatever they want. I, I, I lived in Slough for a while. So oh, that's where, that's where <laughs> LEG is from. If I'm not, if I'm is, not he, is he from there? Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That, that seems like where he would be from. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or, or near their stains. They all, they're pretty close. I think so. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's lots of stains in, in, in Slough too. <laughs> Classic. So, so bad. Like just going back, you know, it sounds like your dad was a, a big influence on your life. Uh, maybe, maybe you can just take us back to sort of those early years for you growing up in Alabama growing up in Alabama is uh, for me it was uh, an interesting thing what one thing that is popular there just like um, football is in, in England uh, is is our version of football American football but for the uh, college level and so it's a really really big deal just like you know football matches are in England um, college American football in Alabama is a very big deal and it's such a big deal that it will cause fights. It will cause mm-hmm. marriages to end in divorce. <laughs> it will cause uh, a person to um, drive in the middle of the night, two hours to a, a special place where one school celebrates a victory. And it, he literally poisoned the trees in this little park area and then called a national sports talk show the next day and admitted and confessed to this crime that he poisoned these trees and uh, ended up, uh, I believe in prison for a few years and, you know, fines that probably will never be paid back. But it was, yeah, I mean, it it is a, a uh, intense love and uh, hatred depending on which side you're on. But um, so that, that's, that's something that when you grow up in the state of Alabama, if you ever meet someone from Alabama, you can ask them that question. Like, who is your college American football team? And they're likely to say one of two schools. They're going to say the University of Alabama or they're going to say Auburn University. Those are the two like rivals that are really big in that state. And you pick one. You have to pick mm-hmm. one. And then for the whole year, you're kind of mm-hmm. messing with your, your buddies all year, you know, on the other side. Uh, and that, you know, whoever wins that game, they get the bragging rights for the following year. So that, that was something that is very unique to Alabama. Um, another thing that, that I love about uh, where I grew up, I grew up in a town, uh, it's Montgomery, it's the capital of the state of Alabama. So if it, you were to ever go there, not that you should or not that you would, but if you do, 
there are two things that you want to consider doing in Montgomery, Alabama, and ideally in the summertime or the springtime, not, not in the winter or the fall. The first one is uh, you can go and rent kayaks and you can kayak down the Coosa River. And this is an amazing thing. It's, it's, it's an absolute blast. You're out in nature. It's beautiful. And it's, uh, it's perfect. It's, it's a great way to spend a couple of hours. Uh, it is a little bit of exercise, too, which is good. Uh, so if you get a chance and it's the, the right weather, go ahead. Go ahead and get those kayaks and uh, go down the Coosa River. The second thing is, uh, surprisingly, you wouldn't expect this from Alabama, but in Montgomery they have, a, uh, they have the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Being from mm -hmm. England, uh, you would think, oh, that's, you know, we have the real thing here. But in Alabama, they don't. So they have the next best thing, which is the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. It's a massive theater. Uh, it's mm. quite beautiful. The grounds and everything is amazing. They have art museums. and There's all kinds of cool stuff there. So that's a really neat thing to check out if you're ever in Montgomery. Mm. So those are my top two things to think about uh, and check out if you ever go through that area of the country, of the U.S. Uh, please check it out. But, but isn't there some, is there some more history around like Montgomery? I was actually watching a movie the other day. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, like... Some, there's a lot some, of civil rights history. exactly that's mm. exactly that's, what it was yeah there's a lot of civil rights history i'm quite proud of that uh but what i'm not as proud of is is you would like to see in 2019 you'd like to see more progression in that state and in mm. that city than where things are but there is no question that uh that um, the history there from civil rights, Dr. Martin Luther King having a, a pastor to church there. And then uh, Rosa Parks is that's where she, um, hmm. uh, where she decided she wasn't going to sit in the back of the bus. She was going to hmm. you know, stay in hmm. there. For three feet. And there's a number of things like that, that happened in Alabama. And there, there's others that I could name, but um, the good thing is that they did happen and it, and it caused uh, a movement, a civil rights movement that, that still to this day is having an awesome impact uh, for for everyone in our country uh, and much needed uh, but the, you know the sad part is is you like we said like to see uh, that progression be further along and I believe over time it will be and and so we look forward to to seeing more of that over time but uh, you know it's still a a place where you know not everybody's hanging out with each other not everybody likes each other and you know you like to see some of that uh, go away uh, but that being said, uh, I am proud that, that that is where some of that happened. And, um, you know, podcast movement, we absolutely love diversity and encourage it as much as mm. possible. We are absolute best to showcase that at our, our events. And so that's near and dear to us. And uh, so, yeah, Montgomery's got some, some pretty interesting history. And um, now I live in South Florida and it's like a culture, cultural melting pot. You got a little bit of everybody down here. So it's, quite different <laughs> i'm the one that stands out in south Florida. <laughs> but it's <laughs> nice you know we you know we're from south africa obviously and we we, we totally mm -hmm. resonate with with diversity like that it's it's sure. great to you know just to to have different influences in your life and uh yeah it's just it's really fascinating and, and the whole um football thing is, is also really fascinating um there it's such a mess like college football is is huge isn't it and yeah. actually i read an article yesterday about a guy rob um Gronkowski, who who was talking mm -hmm. about how he fixed his um, his CTE, because obviously this is quite a big thing at the moment, this concussion story. And I would sure. imagine in a state like that, it's it's kind of being it's not a big hot topic because not because it's such a football state. I would imagine so. It's it's quite fascinating. You know, in the past, it would it would be considered a weak a, a sign of weakness if you mm. didn't just get out and suck it up and play. And uh, unfortunately, a number of players have uh, had a lot of um, you know, major injuries and, and, and some untimely death even. And so it's, it's really great to see that uh, that is being taken. Uh, the, a lot more precautions are being taken about that now. But in the past, yeah, that was, oh, you know, that's not a big deal. Uh, you need to get out there and just suck it up and play. And, and, uh, and no, it is a big deal. So we, we see a lot of, uh, including in wrestling, you know, people with concussions that have died early and got addicted to pain medications and things like mm -hmm. that. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's good to see that, that being taken more seriously. And, yeah. um, I, I want to share this as a little off topic, but I had some friends from South Africa and they would always, they'd always say, what's up brew. And I would always be like, why do they, why do they call me brew? Like, they didn't understand that. So I finally asked them, I'm like, what is brew? Is that like beer? Or like where I grew up and you say brew, that's like a brewery, like a beer. beer. Yeah. 
And they're like, no, it's like, bro. It's like, what's up, bro? So, so now whenever I see South African friends, I'm always like, what's up, bro? And they're, hey, bro. they're either give me the weird look or they're, or they're like, oh, you know our talk or whatever. Oh, uh, it's so funny. Well, yeah. Well, the, the well, guys, best... what's up, bro? Yeah, yeah, exactly. How's, they, they, how's it, bro? How's it, bro? Did they teach you like butts? How, how's it going, butts or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> they, taught me, they taught me things like I shouldn't say on this show. I'll put it to okay, yeah, <laughs> they, were talking about, they were talking about words I didn't know and I had to ask what they meant. And when I found out what they meant, I was like, oh, okay. We can call uh, that something with, else. Yeah, with yeah. some other <laughs> reference to someone other's mother. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's usually. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, well, anyway, I learned, I learned what a slapper was. I didn't know what the hell was. Uh, oh, okay. classic. <laughs> you can edit that part of the, out of the show if you like. Uh, but, that's so uh, funny. Uh, but, 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 but just the second talking about the american football still um mm -hmm. uh, i went one of my favorite nights ever and best memories ever was i, I was 18 years old I, I i looked i worked in a summer camp in america and then afterwards oh, cool. i went on i went traveling for like a few months afterwards mm -hmm. and the guy who was my my like bank counselor the head of my my, my bank um in the in the camp uh, he was actually from alabama but he was studying at uh, university of virginia and mm -hmm. um when I went there, I went I, like I went to go stay with him like for a couple nights after camp at the university, and uh, the University of Virginia was playing UVA, so like massive rivalry. And I was, and he's like, yeah. "Cool, we're going to this college game." I'm like, "Okay, cool." And we rock up at the stadium, and there's sixty thousand or eighty thousand people at the yeah. stadium, and I'm like what the hell is going on yeah and he's like <laughs> welcome to college football and i was like this is amazing and it, it was is. literally one of the best days and nights ever and then it was like for us you know like from south africa we watch these american movies and you see like you know you have these open streets and then everyone goes back and you have these massive house parties and there's kegs and everything like that <laughs> it was exactly like that seriously yes. and i was literally like i am in heaven seriously this is my favorite one of my favorite nights ever so I totally get the American football vibe. Just, yeah, the, the, the term they use for that is tailgating, and and they yeah, that's what they do. They do it for uh, they do it for the professional American football as well. They'll come early and stay late, and they'll cook out and have food, and it's like everybody's, you know, like a one big family in a way. It's it's kind of uh, fun. So. Yeah, totally. It's a real yeah, it's like an institution in a way, like it's a, yeah. a, an identity well in some in some mm -hmm. way. So, so Jared, when you were when you were twelve, um, your dad actually lost his job, and and your family had to do whatever it could to survive. Basically, it must have been quite tough times at that stage. Well, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there, there's been a lot of challenges uh, through the years, and um, one thing that I learned about my dad, um, I, unfortunately, he passed away when I was young. Um, but, but one thing that I always loved about him is he was, he was, um, a person of integrity. He always treated people well. I don't remember my dad ever saying anything bad about anybody. And I, I wish I could say the same thing. I'm, I'm mm. going to talk bad about, uh, probably you guys after this, hopefully not. You but, spoke about a slapper but, a moment ago. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but my, my dad, he just, he just treated people kind, with kindness and, uh, you know, when problems came up, he was very uh, creative with his problem solving. And because he was uh, so generous and kind and knew so many people, there's a lot of really interesting stories where uh, we'd have specific things that we would need. And, uh, you know, some families might be embarrassed and not want to ask for help. But my dad would get on the phone. I remember um, our hot water heater exploded in this house we were living in. And so there was a lot of water damage. And, you know, there wasn't money to pay for new carpeting or anything. And my dad had done a favor, uh, like a fundraiser for a gentleman who owned a carpet mill, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> and um, it, it occurred to him. And when he did it, he did it as a, you know, pro bono. He just did it as a favor. And, um, you know, so these couple weeks later or months or however long it was, he called this gentleman up and said, hey, you know, we uh, have this budget and that it needs to include installation for carpet. Is there any way you can help us? And uh, that, that guy's like, come on down here, pick out whatever you want. Uh, they they did that. My mom and my dad went and, and picked out the carpet and this gentleman had him, his team come out to the house and install it and, and didn't charge us a dime. Like just, so wow. there was like this brand new carpet in our home that um, probably was worth a lot more than, you know, we, we had the budget for at the time. So there's a lot of little stories like that. Um, and I, I think um, the mentality of, of treating others well, um, you know, just, just being a person that, uh, wants to bring value to others. That's a, that's a really awesome takeaway. There is uh, when you are in a situation and and 
uh, you don't have a solution or you might need some guidance or some wisdom, you can go in and reach out to people and people are very willing uh, to, to hear you out and to possibly help you or to possibly point you uh, to another connection or, or to some mm. kind of resource. And, um, you know, I can't say that the, the, the story always ends with new carpet, <laughs> but it, it does, uh, it does remind me that, uh, that's just a good way to treat people. It's a good way to live. And, um, you know, so when you do run into challenging times, it, it really does help to have a lot of good people that care about you that, uh, can potentially encourage you or help you or whatever that is. Yeah, for mm. sure, man. For sure. That's Look, an interesting story. I've never told that on a podcast. So yeah, you guys yeah. Are, that's really thanks cool. for sharing that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's nice, really nice to to reminisce and remember these things. Um, mm-hmm. is, is there anything like uh, in particular that stands out in terms of lessons and stuff that you think your your dad taught you just through the way he was, or maybe intentionally? Well, I'll say this: um, at one of our conferences, a gentleman came to our conference that my dad was also a university professor. He taught uh, communications. And I remember um, at this conference, I met this guy for the first time. He had emailed me ahead of time to let me know he was coming and that he knew my father and that he was a student in his class. And, and when I met this gentleman for the first time, this was actually at Podcast Movement when we were in Anaheim, California. Um, he was talking to me and then he started, he started weeping, <laughs> which was a little bit awkward. We're at a conference and, um, you know, we're just hanging out and talking and everybody's in a good mood and, it, it, you know, it's a <laughs> cheerful place. And uh, this guy is weeping and, and so I'm a little taken aback by that because I'm in conference mode and, and, uh, and, and his weeping wasn't, uh, you know, sorrow or anything. It was just uh, him remembering, um, you know, the, those, uh, that chapter or that season of his life and, and how being in that class and the impression that my dad had made on him and kind of mm. taught him in that, you know, season again, uh, was very impactful. And for him to come nice. to podcast movement now and see, uh, me being his son, uh, you know, now with a, a new generation of, of media uh, being podcasting, not broadcasting, traditional broadcasting, um, that had a, a really profound impact on him. And, um, you know, I don't know how much credit I can take for that other than that's just kind of the way the things played out. But um, it, to me, it, it reminds me that, um, you know, again, I mentioned my father passed away when I was young. So, you know, I wish that I had grown up and known him better than I did. But uh, what I do know about him is that uh, he he really went the extra mile with a lot of folks and treated people um, with with a lot of compassion and kindness and uh, had a, a really awesome influence over a lot of folks because of that. And so in that specific moment, meeting someone and and um, you know him sharing that story with me, that was really awesome to hear um, mm. of how you know his connection to my father years ago had still influenced him you know to where he is now. So. Wow, that's, that's so cool, man. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. Like, so moving. Like, you must mm-hmm. have really been moved as well, like, when you realized that's where the, <laughs> well, where the sort of tears were coming from. <laughs> you know, I, I wish my mom had been there that year. She didn't come to Podcast Movement that year, but my wife was there. And, you know, my wife, um, she knows some stories about my dad, but she doesn't know a lot of that stuff. So mm-hmm. she was able to see that and experience that. And I, mm-hmm. I think for her, that uh, kind of gave her a, another side of of you know these these things that, that she knew little about me mm. um even though we're married and we've been together for many years now you know that's that's a, a portion of my life and things that she just mm. doesn't know much about so it kind of gave her a glimpse mm. of that mm. so, yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. and that's why we enjoy these conversations with people because you, <laughs> yeah. you can you know because you can know someone really well but at the end of the day you don't know everything obviously and and sometimes these things come out and it's it's really great to to expose these things and discuss them and it's just testament to your dad clearly like when people wanted to help him it's not just because he was nice he obviously helped a lot of people in in his process too so it just shows you like um, you never know like when you might need someone's help so just be a kind person just you right. know just go out there and be good so i um, i mean you spoke about it briefly jared is like being growing up in the deep south, you were exposed to a lot of diversity um, uh, in your life, and and so um, has, has that sort of shaped you, and and how has it shaped you into the person that you are today? I think it's uh, shaped me in the sense that I have a, a greater. Uh, oh, I've always been a person that kind of loves the underdog, and uh, you know I really want to see the underdog win. 
and that that that's in all areas sports um i typically like to see the underdog you know come out victorious so uh for me being a part of an event like podcast movement and having some form of influence where we can determine um who are um some organizations or who are some speakers or who are some people that we can kind of put in positions uh, to get some extra visibility and, and mm. uh, to play a role in the event is, is such a, a blessing because uh, we have the ability to make some decisions and, and make some selections that aren't obvious. And that means a lot to me. So uh, uh, one example is our, uh, one of our keynote speakers from this past uh, event, which was um, just a few weeks ago, as Patrice Washington. And I, I hope that your listeners will consider uh, looking her up, but Patrice came to podcast movement two years prior. She did not have a podcast. She'd had some success in uh, some books and coaching and, and media. And she had actually been on a radio show as a co-host uh, with uh, a, a, somewhat of a celebrity, a uh, Steve Harvey. Some people will know uh, and yeah. most people will know in the U S yeah. and, and maybe abroad, but uh, Steve Harvey uh, had a, has a radio show and she was a co-host on that for a long time. And, and so she kind of had built up her reputation in other forms of media, but never in podcasting. She came to podcast movement, wanted to start a podcast. She told her story of how she started a podcast and then, and now coming back two years later and, and having that podcast grow, um, not just from listeners, but also from a, a form, you know, extra revenue that's uh, added to her business. Mm. And it was just so uh, awesome to hear someone get up there and, and just say, Hey, this is where I was. I'm just like a lot of you. Mm. And this was what, this is what I, uh, I was very intentional. This is what I focused on. These are the takeaways that I had. I didn't let myself get caught up in the shiny object syndrome and, mm. and drinking from a fire hose where there's, you know, so much information that I'm, I'm, I can't take it all in or I'm taking copious notes. You just said, I, I come to podcast movement and I just focused on a couple of key things that I knew I needed at the time. And, mm. you know, two years later, her podcast is um, doing amazing. And, and she even quoted, uh, you know, some of the money she's making from the podcast and not that it's about that, but in her case, it was a lot of money. It was more than mm. most of us make in you know, in a year or even two for some people. Mm. So it was, it was a lot of uh, just really exciting to say, Hey, here's somebody who, you know, was new to podcasting and two years later, they've really um, applied a lot of things and learned, um, you know, not, not the podcast movement can take credit for her success. But, you know, her saying, I came to this conference and I, I learned these things, I applied these things, and now this show is, is seeing really awesome results uh, from those decisions. And so uh, I think that's one of the, the things that I really appreciate is, is uh, you know, Patrice is a woman of color, and I think that message was, was very clear for everybody in attendance is if Patrice can do this, if Patrice can start from nowhere and or, or start from nothing in podcasting and, and create a show just like me and, and she can be smart about it and, and follow, follow these, you know, certain strategies, um, she can put herself in a position to, to be at this level now. That's something that someone else can do as well. And so that was a wonderful takeaway, I think, from this year. Uh, and, you know, the fact that we're in a position to give – the keynote stage or give a, an opportunity for a breakout or a panel or, or whatever it is to someone who has a wonderful story, but just not everybody knows who they are yet. Mm. And so like I talked about like the wrestlers, you know, they're right. They're not everybody <laughs> knows about the wrestlers or, 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 you know, somebody else who's doing a podcast in, in some niche that we would kind of laugh about and think, well, is that a thing? Uh, one gentleman that spoke this year has a, a network, a very successful network and his, his network is about uh, heating, you know, and air conditioning and training people in that specific field. Uh, and it's very, very blue collar work. And, and, you know, there might be some that would listen to that and be like, Oh, I, I don't have any interest in an HVAC podcast, but you might have interest in learning that his podcast gets six over six figures a year in, you know, ad revenue. <laughs> okay. Well, how does he do that? Uh, so, so yeah, I love being in a position to showcase, uh, you know, all types of voices. And that is at the heart of podcast movement is, is really, um, you know, wanting to make sure that we uh, have a safe place where everybody can get up and share. And that that's when we say everybody, we pretty much mean everybody of all, mm. all types of backgrounds, um, you know, all types of political views, all types mm. of um, a little bit of everybody. And, and 
Um, you know, we haven't had many issues with that, thankfully. You know, we, we, we sometimes have to remind people before they take the stage, hey, this isn't a, um, a session where you're complaining about the president. This is a session where we're talking about podcasting. So there's little mm-hmm. things that pop up here and there about that, but it's really not a big deal. Most people are understanding. And, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, being – uh, raised in a, in a certain environment like Alabama and then, um, uh, you know, some other parts of my, my life, uh, I used to be in the military and, and my experience in the military also just added on to that, you know, just the, mm-hmm. um, opportunity to, uh, be friends and, and be welcoming, you know, all, all types of folks. And mm-hmm. so that's what we try to do at podcast movement. And we're going to continue to, you know, make that a, a priority and we see good things happen when we do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really but, noticeable. yeah, totally noticeable, but, and, and, you know, not even yeah. at, not even just at podcast, movement, but also mm. just online and in, in, in your Facebook group and all these sort of things, you know, it's so obvious that, uh, that's like an important thing for you guys. And, and it's, it's incredible, but like literally you, you know, through just giving somebody like an opportunity to talk, uh, you can literally change their lives. So, you know, mm-hmm. seriously, well done for setting up such an epic, uh, epic sort of platform for people. And um, talking about doing other things, actually, uh, you were a music- musician once in the, you know, back in the day. And An uh, aspiring. Yeah, yeah. Well, but it sounds like you, you almost, uh, you know, you almost made it, but you eventually <laughs> stopped for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know where, where you're getting this info. I don't know that I almost made it, but there was a time where all I cared about was music and and I, I, let's be honest, I was single and I thought playing guitar helped me meet more girls. And, and so that was uh, <laughs> the reason that I started to learn. But yeah, I, I it's proven, isn't it? I took music very seriously for a number of years. And then um, as I got married and, and things, you know, I got a little bit uh, less focused on it. But now I'm kind of having that itch again. Like I mentioned before, we hit record here. I've, I've recently got a new guitar and I have an eight year old daughter who loves to sing. And so we, we bust out the guitar and have little jam sessions. And um, so for me, if, even if that's the pinnacle of my music career uh, or whatever that's going to be, if, if it, if it just was me and my daughter jamming out, you know, uh, several times a week, I, I think that's a win. I'm pretty happy with that. So. Yeah, but for sure. But I also, I actually, like, I remember you speaking about this and you, and you said like, <laughs> you 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 almost like made it but i guess kind of a bit of self doubt and self sabotage got in the way is that kind of what happened <laughs> no, that's true. yeah i it, yeah i i mean okay i'm 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 thankful that you're helping me kind of navigate this um <laughs> yeah I, I i think if i had applied myself more and i had been a little bit more serious and more focused at the age of of when that was so important to me i think maybe i could have of taken that uh taken that further than I did. Um, so, so, you know, these are not major, um, accolades, but, you know, having songs that were written by me featured by, you know, up and coming at the time, up and coming independent artists that would take my songs and put it on their, you know, album, Hmm. those types of things, uh, getting to play in, in different cities and, and, and a little bit of touring. And, um, you know, some people might consider that a success. I, I, look at it now and just be like oh that was you know just for fun or whatever and we made a little bit of money and it was no big deal (laughs) signing an autograph after after a concert little little things like that so so if you consider those things making it then yes uh but um but yeah i i I think um at that particular stage of my life i needed to go through some more life experience i needed to understand myself better there was just things that i wasn't quite ready for and it took me several more years of, of going through uh, a, a career in a, a different field and being married and having family and, and responsibilities and other things that, that then helped me to, to learn some things that I, I just couldn't learn when I was young and just dreaming about being a musician. Um, so I, I don't in any way have any regrets, uh, but, I, but I know if I knew now, uh, you know, if I, if I knew – knew then what I knew now, I, I'm pretty sure I could have handled things a little bit differently and, and probably taken that in a different direction and in a more positive direction and done more things with it. Uh, but you know, you can't really live your life that way. I don't think, I think uh, you can't, you know, you can't always play the what if game, <laughs> you, mm. you make the decisions you make and you, uh, you learn from the things you learn. And I, I don't really have any regrets because the decisions that I made ultimately led me to where I am now. 
and mm-hmm. it's connected me with the people it's connected me with. It's allowed me to meet my wife. It's allowed me to have my daughter. It's allowed me to, um, you know, be in a position to uh, help people in podcasting and stuff. And, and um, maybe that's not as glamorous as uh, being on a stage, you know, singing and playing the guitar. And, and uh, But when I'm jamming out with my daughter in my living room, to me, that's uh, just as fun. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, yeah, I really don't have any regrets. I, I think there were some wonderful things that I learned from being a musician, like having the confidence to be in front of people and, and perform and, and being able to speak. And I think those are really great uh, things to be able to do in a lot of uh, different fields, depending on mm. you know what, what type of career, or what type of business or what type of uh, pursuit you feel compelled uh, to, to do. Mm. Uh, so I think, yeah, there were some great things that I learned from that process process creatively, professionally, uh, personally that, that now apply into other things that I do now. Cool, man. And what genre of music were you playing? Uh, just acoustic guitar. So for, for, uh, maybe, uh, the, the Ed Sheeran kind of style, uh, you know, that was more mm-hmm. maybe what I was going for back then. So awesome, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and talking about, you know, all these lessons that you've learned. I mean, you, you, you took a lot from all these, these life experiences that you've had. What other things would you sort of tell the younger Jared now that, that, you know, if you, if you could, you know, if we could look back and go there, what sort of yeah. things would you say? Uh, well, I, I was in the military, I was in the Navy and the acronym for Navy uh, in the U S uh, that some people joke that have been in the military and have been in the Navy. They say that, acronym for Navy stands for never again, volunteer yourself. <laughs> that, that's a joke. Of course I had a great, mostly great experience in the military, but um, there were nights, sleepless nights and different things where I was thinking, Oh man, I made, I didn't pick the, the right um, branch of service or I didn't pick the right job or whatever. Uh, but uh, I think another thing is uh, there was a, a, a girl I dated right after the Navy. I would tell myself not to date her. That was not, <laughs> not a positive experience. I won't name her. <laughs> I would I would tell myself stay away from her, and uh, yeah, I would try. I'd probably tell myself to to uh, you know uh, your metabolism is going to change when you hit forty. So, uh, you know the the beverages and the uh, you know the the uh, tacos and other things. You might want to not go so crazy. Uh, so those are a few things that come to mind. But but I think for the most part, I don't, I don't really want to. Uh, change the path too much. I'm pretty thankful yeah. that, that I've, uh, you know, ultimately landed where I am. I feel really fortunate, actually. Mm. So it's fascinating. We often have discussed this. You know, all the, the, you know, ten years ago, you'd think, well, I'd love to have done that, but you just weren't <laughs> ready. And you know, and it's just, it's just one of those things that it all comes together when it's meant to come together. And you, there's no changing that path. Like you, all the things had that needed to happen, happen to get you where you are now, which is, which is pretty cool. And you mentioned the sort of joining the Navy uh, a moment ago. And mm-hmm. uh, so maybe, yeah, just tell us a little bit about that, that process and, and how that was for you. The, the benefits for me was uh, at the time I was, uh, didn't really have a lot of, of structure or direction of what to do. I had tried college and university and, and I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do. And I didn't have a lot of resources uh, to pay for it. So I was working and paying for it. And I didn't want to go into debt. Uh, I had enough common sense, uh, at least or I thought I did, to not um, take out a lot of student loans to um, barely pass college and, and take some kind of uh, career path that at the time I didn't even know what I wanted to do. So for me, joining the military was a, a positive experience because it uh, basically put me in a position where I could um, not have to worry about a place to live and not worry about a paycheck. And I could uh, also be exposed to things that I wouldn't have been exposed to any other way. So a big portion of my maybe experience was living in Hawaii. And I, I realized not a lot of people you know, who joined the Navy get to even go to Hawaii. So to get to live there and... Mm-hmm. Uh, be at Pearl Harbor, which is, of course, historic, and uh, just experience the culture out in Hawaii. I really, really loved Hawaii, and um, I met some neighbors that were Filipino and just loved their culture. They embraced me. They were really kind to me, and I, I made some wonderful friends out there, and that ultimately, <laughs> I know this is going to sound kind of funny, but that ultimately, uh, when I left Hawaii, I, I immediately thought, well, when I'm 
as I'm trying to date, you know, I want to try to date a, a Filipino girl because I like this family and I like that culture. And that uh, decision really kind of led me to meeting my wife, Rachel. She's Filipino. She's originally from Florida, uh, but her parents are from the Philippines. But uh, so in a way, yeah, joining the Navy and, and being stationed out in Hawaii, that uh, kind of led me down the path of, of wanting to meet a Filipino girl, which I don't think I would have uh, had that path. Mm -hmm. and not had that experience so mm -hmm. uh, kind of random but it's true yeah that's really cool though like you know what i mean yeah. like just finding out what you really like and what you <laughs> want in life at the end of the yeah. day i guess um which is awesome so what did you actually do in the navy and, and were there any sort of, sort of like profound lessons do you feel <laughs> uh, i i was an electronics technician and what that basically means is I, I cleaned. I was a janitor. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure there's more to it than that, but it seemed like that's all I did. I was on a submarine, actually. I was on a, a, a fast oh, wow. attack submarine. And uh, so when you're on a fast attack submarine, you go out to sea, and you'll be out to sea for, it could be several weeks, could be longer. And um, the days are split up uh, in six-hour intervals. So a typical day is an 18-hour day at sea. Uh, six of the hours are spent doing what, what they call a, an at sea watch station. Uh, so you get qualified at different jobs that uh, you would perform based on your qualifications. And then for six hours, you're doing uh, department uh, duties. So there's different departments that you're in as uh, electronics technician. So we had different responsibilities in that department that we had to do. So we'd spend six hours focusing on those responsibilities. And then you have six hours where you can go to sleep or you can eat or you can uh, watch a movie or whatever that is and and uh, what a lot of people don't realize because submarines are so small if you are uh, enlisted meaning you're not an officer uh, most of the lower ranked enlisted guys they share a bed so this kind of goes back to hmm. the story that we were talking about pre-recording wow. this podcast <laughs> but um, every six hours someone would roll out their sleeping bag on this on this like little bunk bed and get in their sleeping bag and, and fall asleep. And then the end of that six hours, they would roll up their sleeping bag and someone else would unroll their sleeping bag on the same wow. bed. We call that hot racking. <laughs> and so that, that's kind of a normal thing. Uh, it's kind of gross now that I think about it. I wouldn't want to do it again. But uh, during that season of my life, I was, I was definitely someone who had to hot rack. So I wow. shared a rack with two other guys. And uh, <laughs> at any six hour period, there was you know one of us in there. So, that's pretty uh, cool you'd be so <laughs> naked by the end of the day like you just you didn't care you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah it's well yeah yeah exactly at the end of the time you're just like i just want to go to sleep and yeah you kind of, you kind of get over some of that stuff so we yeah. actually now, now i would be like i don't think i could ever do that now but uh, <laughs> yeah. back then it was just, that's the way it was yeah we we interviewed um, Donovan Marsh, who who mm -hmm. directed um, Hunter Killer, um, which is a recent movie with Gerard Butler um, about the sub the new submarine um, class, uh, and uh, it was crazy. How he, so he actually spent three days on the submarine, and and he was just saying how how cramped like how cramped it is, even on this massive submarine. Oh, it's man. still like a quite a crazy experience down there. It really is, and I, I'm five foot ten. Um, so, you know, I don't know what that is in, uh, in the, uh, metrics is <laughs> for me, uh, I, I'm tall enough that when I would be in certain areas, I would hit my head constantly. If I wasn't wow. very, if I wasn't closely paying attention because it, the ceilings are low and the, you know, you would, you just had to really kind of duck a lot. And I remember that uh, I'm not that tall, but I was tall enough where it was uncomfortable. So if someone's taller than that, like maybe six foot or taller, I mean, they, they really had had it worse than me uh they would and that was um, that was pretty common you'd be w walking around the ship or we call it a boat and um you know you'd hear somebody yell out some kind of profanity and, and it'd be a <laughs> bang their head because they <laughs> turned their head and you know did something uh but wow. it is very cramped and the the thing that i did for entertainment is i would bring my guitar i was back to the kind of playing into the musician role mm. that i was aspiring even at that time and there would be a group of us, there'd be like 10 or 12 of us that would go into this small room and, and we'd bust out the guitar and then we would literally sing songs, you know, a bunch of guys singing songs by the Eagles or, um, you know, the different bands, uh, Beatles, whatever. And we would, we would do that. And that was like our entertainment. And I would, I would be the guy playing the guitar. So when we pull into port, I never had to pay for a beer. Everybody would be buying me beer 
like nonstop because I I was the guitar <laughs> player. I was the true cool. so, yeah, so I don't ever remember buying a beer that. in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a, that was a bonus. Yeah. I was, I was a form of entertainment on the, on the boat in addition to my other responsibilities. So, but that, that, that's my best memories actually from the Navy is being in, being in those groups and singing every type of song you can think of classic rock to country, even to, you know, there's just, just so many different types of people that are on these ships, you know, and, and if we didn't know the song, we'd listen to it and try to figure it out and then we, you know, mm. play it. So. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how music can bring people together? Hey, it's, just, it's one of those. It's, 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 I mean, you'd hear guys, uh, you might have heard guys singing Christina Aguilera songs. I mean, it was, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really, really a, a, a touching moment, you know, and oh. when you hear a bunch of guys singing those types of songs. <laughs> what are we doing, guys? Yeah, uh, what have we done here? <laughs> yeah, we had, we, we, had, we had our moments. So. <laughs> So, so Jared, you, um, yeah. you, you know, you touched on it earlier, but um, you, you were a bit of a shy guy, but that, that didn't stop you from uh, going up to talk to a very pretty, a very pretty girl in 2005 That's uh, true. at a party in Orlando. So t- tell That's, us a little bit about that. Well, we, we got to talk about the party in and of itself. So I had had this ambition to try to date a Filipino girl as we had kind of hit on earlier. And when I moved to Orlando, that's where my sister and her family were living. I got out of the military, moved to Orlando, wanted to be closer to them. And, and so I uh, decided I'm going to try to meet a Filipino girl. But I, being a, a Southern Alabama white guy, I had no idea where Filipino people hung out in Orlando. <laughs> I had no clue. And this was pre-Facebook. Uh, I think MySpace was kind of just getting started back then. So it was, uh, which is strange to think, you know, 2005, that that stuff was still kind of not out there yet. But, um, yeah, and now it's so prevalent, you know, but, uh, we didn't have that then. So I was looking around, I found, um, these parties that were, uh, su- surrounding these events for import cars. And <laughs> this thing was called, Vision. I don't even remember how I found it, but I, I found the, these parties and in the pictures, you know, there's all these pretty Asian girls. And I was like, that's where I need to go. <laughs> so they, they were having one of these parties. And I decided I'm going to go to this, and I I was the only white guy there. I mean, it was very obvious. It had to be very obvious that, you know, what's this guy doing here? And I walked in, and I had not had any liquid courage, gentlemen. I mean, this was, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not the uh, clubbing kind of person, typically, that, um, you know, not really my style or have, has, had not been my style. And so I, I was very awkward uh, in, a, in, a, in a place where you I brought the moves. Didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't, didn't fit in uh, at all. But I, I allowed myself t- uh, to look across the room. I did see a couple of girls that I wanted to talk to. And as I was uh, venturing toward them, um, trying to find that courage, I, I noticed that they were talking to another gentleman. He's real tall and, and handsome, kind of like a, a Abercrombie and Fitch model. I don't oh, know if okay. they have that in South Africa, but. Uh, you know, one of these guys that uh, I, I just immediately assume this guy's out, you know, uh, he's above me and I'm down here. And so they're going to be more interested in what he has to say than what I have to say. So there was a temptation uh, temporarily to turn around and walk away. But mm. I, I decided, no, you know, let's, let's not, uh, let's not give into that just yet. So, so being uh, just determined, I think was the right word and intentional. I continued to walk forward. I saw this gentleman pull his wallet out and he pulled out his work ID, which I thought was a little bit strange. And he, he flashes his work ID and I'm close enough at this point where I could see this work ID. Um, so I'm within a couple of feet and, and his work ID said NASA. So the guy worked. Oh, good NASA. Lord. So I'm, yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm right out of the Navy, you know, like I, Tall, I don't dark have, and handsome. And yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah. And he works for NASA. So I, I remember thinking, I am, yeah, I, I need to leave like now. And uh, <laughs> this, this one lady, uh, one girl turned to me and looked at me for like a split second. And I, I said the first thing popped in my head, which I don't recommend as a pickup line, but I said, <laughs> I don't work for NASA, but I'm a really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible line. Awful. Oh, classic. And, but she had had enough beverages where she laughed at that. She actually thought that was funny. And so, yeah, we, we, uh, started talking and, and that was, uh, Rachel, who's now my wife. We started, uh, we connected there at that party and uh, started dating and now later, uh, you know, been together ever since. So that story is, is uh, random, but it's a true story. I went to a party. I didn't know anyone and I met, uh, who's now the girl who's now my wife. Uh, so hopefully that's a source of encouragement to someone if you're, yeah. <laughs> 
feeling like ah, I need to get out more. Well, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, for sure. Do but it. it's it's a lesson for everyone. But it's like if you want to, if you want something in life, you just need to put in the efforts, you know. And it, and you have to get uncomfortable well, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, worst <laughs> case, what you uh, want. Yeah, worst case, they didn't want to talk to me, and I would have just, you know, moved on to another group, or I would have left. So. That would have been the worst case, but thankfully that didn't happen. Yeah, well, that's an awesome story, bud. So it's, it's cool, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't share the, I don't share a lot of this on podcasts very often. So you guys are asking <laughs> really interesting uh, questions. It's a, it's kind of like a walk down amnesia lane a little bit. <laughs> 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 that what happened? Yeah, yeah, it's those cool, are good bud. moments. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally, bud. Totally. So, so, bud, you've actually worked in a, a fair few jobs in IT. You know, I know you obviously, you, you, you sort of went into that, I guess, in, in the Navy, but was that like a career you always wanted to go into? Was it something you were interested in? I never knew exactly what I wanted to get into, although I had um, different ideas in high school of things that, that interested me. I took an entrepreneurial class in high school. I took a, a psychology class. I took a, a class that was on um, economics, and I was, I was on the... Um, school newspaper staff and like I remember those were things that I really liked but I never really had a career counselor or a parent or you know an adult figure sit down with me and kind of talk through what are the things that you're good at what are the things that would make sense to to go into uh, in the future and so I struggled uh, a little bit trying to figure out well, what what is what is it that I should do and, and so for me, I kind of walked through doors as they opened. And that was like you mentioned, IT and the project management field. And I have no regrets because I got into a role uh, that allowed me to do a lot of traveling. And traveling was something that I really enjoyed at the time. I mentioned that I, you know, I'd lived in England temporarily. And uh, you know, part of that was because of this job I was, I was doing. And I've worked in a lot of different uh, countries and, and traveled all throughout North America. And, and so I, I had some awesome experiences because of that and that led me you know eventually to a place where um, I'd kind of climbed a ladder to to a degree and gotten as far as I could get up that ladder Uh, you know I it didn't seem like there was much opportunity for me beyond where I was and that is the thing that that allowed me to start considering what uh, what else is it that I might be good at or what is, what is it that I might be interested in, which led me to listening to podcasts, led me to reading uh, books. It, it, it just got me um, excited again to, to start figuring out what's my potential. Uh, what is it that I can be good at? What is it that I can learn and do? And, you know, the idea of entrepreneurship had never really occurred to me outside of that class in high school, but I, I had found out about a podcast called uh, internet business mastery. Uh, this was back in, man, it's probably like 2000, I want to say 2010, maybe it's just something like that. And, um, it was two guys out of Utah. They weren't even using their real names. I don't know why, but I found they were using like, <laughs> like stage names and they were talking about how they've created an internet business and left their day jobs. And, um, I remember hearing that and thinking that's possible. Like people could actually do that. Uh, and yeah, so that, that got me on a path that for the next several years, just, just absorbing as much as I could and learning what I could and uh, thinking through and trying to figure out what my strengths were, reading books like Strength Finder and uh, taking different, uh, you know, different profile tests to, to kind of figure out what my personality and what my skills and interests were and, and uh, taking all that information and then applying it. Uh, and for me, it started as a podcast. I, still, I have a podcast still to this day. It started in 2013. And really the podcast was just a chance kind of like you guys are doing, whereas I, I could talk to some people that I looked up to and, and kind of learn from them. So it was a way of, kind of a way to have some personal development and professional development mm. um, through the form of a podcast. And, and so that's, that's what I did. I started uh, interviewing and, and learning from people and that podcast ultimately led me to um, having a better understanding of, of what it means uh, to create or try to create a business and, and how to validate that idea. And, and so a lot of those things were essential when podcasts and when the idea for podcast movement started and, you know, that's another uh, line of questioning and a whole nother story. Mm. But uh, basically when it came time to know about uh, podcast movement was an idea and how could we validate it to make sure mark the market wanted it. There was a lot of things that I already knew to do because for the last, you know, couple of years I had been 
of reading that type of stuff. And I've been listening to that type of stuff. And I, I was prepared. Mm -hmm. I was um, just in a position that I knew, okay, this is something uh, that makes sense to test. And so we did, we tested. And, and uh, of course that test and that result was positive. And uh, that now led us uh, to where we are now, which is 2019. Uh, you know, we started the event in 2014 and uh, I'm talking about podcast movement, of course. And mm -hmm. now that's our full-time job, myself and my business partner, Dan, and we, we've hired several staff since then. It's, it's really amazing to see the growth of the events and, and the company and, uh, yet surreal at the same time because you know I, I think who am I to have been involved in this and and uh, but it it really is a, a testimony of if you can kind of understand what it is that your strengths are and how you can leverage those and and understand what the needs are in the market and you can uh, align yourself and collaborate with people that have strengths that aren't your own you can put yourself in a position to you know create something meaningful and create something that has a an impact on and, and build a community. And so these are things that podcast movement is doing, uh, has done, and, and hopefully will continue to do as mm. we grow. Hmm. Yes, man. There's so, so many lessons in there, Jared, mm -hmm. seriously, like um, just that personal growth that you made the decision on, like, like meeting your, your now wife, you know, like you had this intention, you said mm -hmm. it and you went for it and, and you had this intention to, to grow your, your skills and, and your, your knowledge base and, and it led you to where you are. And that's a great lesson in there. But there was a time talking about your podcast um, where it actually took you sort of nine months to eventually start your podcast from when you'd had the decision to, 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 to actually make one or do one. Um, but um, yeah. you were afraid of, you were sort of afraid to get going. Why was that? I, I was under the impression then that it was too expensive. Like I'd have to pay, you know, these expensive, buy this expensive microphone and buy this expensive uh, software and, and learn the software that, you know, how to edit. And I, I really just got myself so caught up in thinking this is a, a lot of, of things to do. And it is. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I, I stalled. Uh, and the thing that really helped me to get out of that um, procrastination <laughs> was learning about a microphone called the uh, Audio Technica 2100. I don't know if that's yes. available in other, other countries. Oh, that, that are both, both of you. Them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have an ATR here with me. Um, yeah. I actually use the ATR for my mobile setup, which is where nice. I do most of my podcasting. But um, actually, I love the ATR. But when I found out about the ATR, I realized, oh, this is actually a mic that has really good quality and that is a, a reasonable price for someone mm. who's starting out. And so I bought that mic and then I realized, okay, now I can actually do this. There's no excuses. And there was a number of pivots uh, after that. One of them being that, you know, I, I edited maybe my first 25 episodes. And I remember one night I stayed up an entire night editing a 30 minute podcast episode mm. <laughs> in the morning after I uploaded the episode, I said, what did I just do? Like, mm -hmm. I was like, I can't believe I did that. And um, I needed help. And so I, I sought out, a young college kid who, uh, you know, for a reasonable price point, uh, he, he was in a band and he had garage band on his laptop. And I was like, could you just help me, you know, edit this? I'll, I'll pay you this. And he was like, yeah, I'm just trying to make some extra money. And, uh, so I, I met this college kid and he edited my podcast, uh, there for, you know, another probably 50 episodes. And then I, I, and, uh, he ended up not being able to do it and I found someone else, but I've, I've been working with someone ever since that's helped me. Nice. That. And I think that the takeaway there is um, there's times when uh, you are uncertain and, and you might be stalling because you don't have a certain strength or a certain skill set or a certain bit of knowledge. And um, that's where you need to either try to get help or you need to be having conversations with people that uh, have some more experience than you that can kind of point you in the right direction if you're going to do it yourself mm. or if you're going to, you know, try to find someone who uh, is in a position to help you. Uh, but that is essential to uh, growing, to taking things to a, a, a deeper level is uh, you got to, in most cases, you got to have the knowledge and you got to have the help. And um, if you can't do it yourself or you don't have the time or the bandwidth, then you need to be willing to try to find someone who can help you. And, and mm -hmm. that solution is out there. And sometimes it just requires being a little creative. You know, some people think they have to spend an exorbitant fee to hire this masterful audio technician. Well, I didn't have um, a budget to do that, but I did have a little bit of a budget. So I found a kid in college who <laughs> edits mm -hmm. 
in garage band, you know, for his, for his band and for his music. So, and that worked out for me. And, and, and that may be a situation for someone listening who's starting a podcast. You know, you may not need to hire someone professionally right out of the gate. You may need to just find uh, someone locally in your community that can help you edit that, you know, they have experience with editing on their laptop. So mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but uh, there's, there's lots of creative solutions out there if you're mm -hmm. willing to think about it and ask around and look. Yeah, for sure, man. And we, 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 we are super fortunate now where we, you know, you have like people that can just work from wherever they want digitally and, and you have freelancers everywhere. And, you know, the barriers to entry are kind of like almost non-existent a lot of the time, even, even finance, like from a finance perspective, it's really, you know, affordable to hire people and, uh, you know, like to, to get help and, and also to learn things too. Like literally there's courses everywhere. You, you don't even have to pay. You go to YouTube and you can, so yeah. you know what I mean? You can literally learn how to do things. And, and we, that's exactly what we did. We just learned from YouTube and we, we paid a little bit, but, but not like extortion. That's for sure. And it's right. just incredible. Like what, what the opportunities are. Oh, and I, I, I'm not in any way saying don't, don't spend money. I had to spend money to have someone help me edit my show. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, find what your resources are. Don't, don't squander them on things that aren't actually going to help you. And, uh, it is very easy to get wrapped up into so many things. There's so much knowledge mm -hmm. out there and there's so many, again, this, that they call it the shiny object syndrome, uh, where you could say, okay, I need to learn about this and I need to learn about this. Well, I subscribe to the mindset of, of the, what they call just in time learning, so depending on what it is you're compelled to do right in this moment and what it is you need to do, if you're trying to write a book or if you're trying to start a podcast or if you're trying to start a business, you don't need to learn, you know, everything. You just need to learn the one or two things to get started with that process. Mm -hmm. So that's the focus rather than listening to a 10 hour video mm -hmm. series of, of mm -hmm. podcasting. You know, you may not need all of that right out of the gate. You might just need to learn, okay, I need to figure out what mic to get. I need to figure out what software I need. Uh, just a couple of basics that can kind of get you going and you could kind of learn as you go. Uh, I heard this said once and I really like it. It's a ABC stands for action brings clarity. And I, I hope that's another takeaway for your listeners is uh, you can read books, you can listen to podcasts, you can watch videos on YouTube, you can do all those things all day long. Uh, but one of the best teachers is actually getting your hands dirty and doing it. Mm -hmm. And then you learn as you do it. And that's not, uh, saying that you shouldn't be prudent and you shouldn't get wisdom and you shouldn't uh, do some research ahead of time. You should do those things. Uh, but I think in doing those things and then applying what you're learning, I think that's where you're in a better situation to grow. And then you're in a better situation to understand what the next thing is that you need to learn. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic advice, bud. Yeah. And definitely, like right. you said, taking action, like that's where the, the learning happens. And then it's just, uh, there's nothing better than that, literally. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the difference between a lot of people is the people that said, okay, now I'm not just, I'm going to take this uh, moment to, to actually do this versus the person that uh, knows they should do it, wants to mm. do it, but just never does. And, and I, I'm not hating on my mom here. I'm going to love on my mom a little bit, but my mom mm. has told me time and time again, I, I've got this great idea for a children's book. And okay, it's mm. six years later, where's that children's book? <laughs> uh, and so I've actually challenged her recently. I'm like, hey, let's let's put our minds together. Let's see, let's see if we can actually write this children's book. You've already got all the ideas, and you know, people do this every day. I met a lady the other day. She just put out a children's book. I met her at a conference, and and uh, it can be done. You can do this, even at your age. It's it's possible. Mm. And um, so I'm encouraging my mom now to actually follow through and write this children's book. And I'm not doing it in a way to. Uh, uh, you know, Oh, you got to do this. I'm not trying to be uh, harsh or anything. It's just, I've known uh, deep down, she's mentioned it several times. And so it's like, well, let, let me actually help you. Let's, let's figure out what we need to do, you know, what, you know, or what you need to do to take the next step. And so I'm going to try to help my mom here in the next couple months, uh, put out her first children's book. So hopefully when we talk again, you know, I can show you this little book that my mom's put out, you know, that would be pretty cool. Wow, that's great. super cool, bud. Well, she definitely has a, has a great <laughs> great person to learn from. That's for sure. Because because <laughs> she's a classic example. She's <laughs> talked about it for a long time, and, and here we are, no book yet. So yeah, we're going to try to solve that. That's great stuff, bud. And talking about starting things, like you've obviously mm -hmm. told us about podcast movement, but but maybe right. you can like talk to us a little bit about like how it actually came about, and then also the journey because you know, as with starting everything, like I think, or anything, um, it's not always an easy ride. And, and for you, like it's, it's been, you know, it's been tough and there's been lots of tough times. So yeah, sure. just if you can take us through that, that'd be great. Well, 
it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to validate it. And then it's another thing to execute it. So the idea was, you know, it stemmed from going to another conference where about uh, 25% of the content was for podcasters. The rest was for YouTube and bloggers and social media. And, and, but over half the attendees were podcasters for this entire conference. And I remember hearing people that were attending the conference saying, you know, why isn't there a conference just for podcasters? And at the time there was not anything, um, I, which shocked me. And I still can't believe that there was nothing. And uh, that's where uh, my business partner, Dan, uh, he was not my business partner at the time, but he was someone that I'd collaborated with on, on some other meetups and, and different podcast ideas. And Dan and I said, well, what if, what if we could put on a podcast conference? We didn't have a, a, any experience in event planning, uh, but we knew the market wanted a podcast conference. We knew that I, we ourselves as podcasters would want to attend the type of event that we wanted to create. And so from there it was, how do you validate an idea? How do you, how do you test the idea without putting a lot of resources, time and money and, and things into something that might fail? And for us, the answer to that was Kickstarter. We decided to do a crowdfunding campaign. We did not have an email list. <laughs> we did not have any strong reputation in the industry. Uh, in fact, we were, you know, new podcasters. So we were very, uh, you know, not well known at all. And so we didn't have an email list, but we, what we did have is, is we, we had both hosted podcast interview shows, kind of like this one. And so we had had guests on our shows. So we went to our guests that were also podcasters and we asked them, Hey, will you support this? Will you speak at this? Will you promote it to your, um, to your audience? And we put together, you know, based on looking at other Kickstarter campaigns and trying to figure, there wasn't a lot at that time, there wasn't a lot of events that had been crowdfunded. Uh, mm -hmm. So we were kind of trying to get creative and see, okay, what are some other things that got crowdfunded and how can we incorporate that into an event? And we had had no experience event planning. So uh, it was really just kind of trial by, you know, testing and mm -hmm. trial by fire and doing, doing something that we thought made sense. So we put together a crowdfunding campaign. We had reached out to our friends. We asked for support. We launched it. And I think we were, trying to be very realistic and conservative. And, and we thought 10,000 us dollars, uh, that's not anywhere enough money to put on a quality conference, but it would be enough money to validate the idea that there would mm -hmm. be enough interest. We could then sell tickets, sell sponsorships and hopefully still be able to deliver on a smaller event. And at, at that time we were thinking it would be big time and, and, like amazing if we could get 200 people to attend the conference. Mm -hmm. And so all that being said, we launched the campaign and, and we hit the $10,000 mark in less than one day. And mm -hmm. at the end of the 30 days of the campaign, we had over three times the amount that we were trying to earn. So it was over 30,000 us dollars, which again is not enough to put on a big, big conference, a big quality mm -hmm. conference. Uh, but it was certainly enough validation to move forward. And so from that point on, uh, that was in February of 2014. And our first event was in August of that same year. We learned as much as we could. We got advice from people who had been on our shows that had events. Uh, I remember calling up uh, Philip Taylor, who runs an event called FinCon for financial bloggers. And we had an hour phone call with him. He was very generous. And he, he got on the call with us and said, if I was doing this all over again, uh, here are the things that I would avoid and here's the things that I would do. Hmm. And he, he kind of laid out different things for us to consider. And we went with that and learned as we go, <laughs> basically hmm. learned as we, we went through those processes and we had our first event and not only did we have uh, uh, a great event, but we ended up having three times the amount of people we were hoping to get. We had 600 people in year one. Wow. Uh, and then, you know, now we fast forward to 2000. 19 and you know we had uh, 3,000 registered probably had about 2,800 to attend the event so it's, it's been a massive uh, growth every year um, we're seeing more people that are attending and, and um, those first several years the focus was uh, less about making money which was really hard uh, when you work so hard on something and and you want to pay yourself and there's a little bit of money but um, we knew at the time we need to take every bit of this money that we have and reinvest it back into the event. I think mm -hmm. that's a mistake a number of, of new business owners make is uh, they're so eager to get paid or, or feel the need to get paid that they might uh, potentially 
uh, instead of putting the money back into the business, they, they can um, sacrifice quality a little bit and that can, um, for, unfortunately that can hurt some businesses when they're mm -hmm. starting out. So we've seen that happen with a number of events that lasted maybe one or two years and they quit. They, they just couldn't make it work. And I think that was one of the biggest problems is they were, they were too dependent on having to make money. We, we kept our day jobs. Hmm. Uh, Dan was a CPA and I was a project manager and um, you know, on top of our day jobs working, you know, full time to create a conference. And the, the second year, I'll never forget this. We were, not only did we not make money, we lost money. We lost like forty thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> and 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 that was a moment, a real gut punch for me. That was a moment where I was like, okay, is this th this is a big mistake? You know, we're we're not making progress. We're making a lot of bad decisions. And um, I remember thinking, my wife is she going to stay with me? Is she going to leave me? Mm -hmm. Is she going to? You know, I, I put ourselves at risk. You know, and um, I remember the positive thing that came from that moment uh, after we kind of got over the initial scare and the frustration was, okay, where did we go wrong? What mistakes did we make? And we identified a number of things that we made mistakes on, which was very healthy and very wise. And we put up guardrails for every one of those things hmm. and said, okay, from now on, this won't happen again because we're, we won't allow it. We, it. we just won't do that. And so the third year was the first year we were actually profitable and uh, the fourth year, you know, we've been profitable ever since then, but it was 2018, January of 2018, before Dan and I actually left our jobs and went full time with podcast movement. So it was, you know, almost five years of really working a full time job on top of full time jobs mm, <laughs> to get geez. this conference uh, to be viable financially. And, and you know, that's, I think the, the difficulty in that was, people would come to the conference that didn't know that backstory and they would say, wow, this is amazing. This is great. You guys are killing it. And we're like, we're, we're being killed. <laughs> you mm. know, like we're, <laughs> we're, we're working around the clock trying so hard to get this, you know, and build this thing. And, and I remember there were many times where I was like, I don't think I'm cut out for entrepreneurship. I think this is a bad decision. I need to go back and mm. you know, reevaluate my priorities. But, uh, we knew we had enough validation each year from the attendees and the, the uh, sponsors and exhibitors and all those things. And then, uh, you know, we built up a runway. We built up enough for a six month runway where January, 2018, we had left our job, started podcast movement full time. We've been going ever mm -hmm. since. Um, but it, it that, you know, that was a very calculated risk. That wasn't a, a very dangerous thing or a decision to make. We knew, okay, if we can't do this in six months, then, you know, we need to go back and get jobs and, you know, either not do it or find other areas we need to correct. Uh, mm -hmm. But at that point, we had enough experience that, you know, we were able to put all our focus and all our energy just on the event. And that made a big difference. And that mm -hmm. uh, kind of put us in a position where we are now, mm -hmm. um, not only where we're running an event, but we actually have staff, like we've hired a, a full-time sales rep and a full-time event planner, and a, a full-time editor that does our daily newsletter now. And that's, um, you know, potentially going to compete with the top newsletters in the industry um, mm -hmm. sooner than later. Um, th there's just some really cool and exciting things. We've, we've hired, we had a summer intern now we've hired her full time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so we've made some uh, strategic hires. We have some contractors that work with us. And it's like, uh, all of a sudden it's just like, we have this little family, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have this, this team, this, you know, we have a team, we have a, like, how did that happen? Uh, but we do. And, and I feel really fortunate of that. And they, these are people that are really awesome and they fit with the culture and they've, they understand it and they get it and they want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just such a wonderful thing to, to be able to say, here, here's money that we've made from putting on, putting on this event that can now pay these people a good salary where they can be a part of taking this thing and growing it even more. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really encouraging thing. Um, so I, I love that about podcast movement. There's a lot of things I love about podcast movement, but uh, being able to, to um, have team members and, and then the support of the community the way we do. I think that's, uh, it's not by accident. I, I think it's, mm. it's taken a lot of um, risk and a lot of sacrifice. Uh, another thing that I'll share real quickly, uh, I'm talking and talking, but I, I feel mm. this is important, is, is community, at least from our limited experience, which is a few years now building a conference, is, is really built when you make it about the community and not about yourself. And so, 
what I mean by that is, is the decisions that Dan and I made, uh, my business partner and I made, we, we, we decided from the very beginning, we would not purposely, we would not be the figureheads of podcast movement. We would not put our faces on all the logos and we would not take the stage at our own event and speak. You know, there's a temptation to do that mm -hmm. uh, depending on what your goals are and what you're creating. Uh, but for us, we didn't do that. We believe that if it's true, if it's really about community, it can't be about us. And, and so we made that decision. And I think what's wonderful about that decision now, you know, being that we're going into our seventh event this next year, our seventh year, is the things that people would want from being on stage or from uh, having their face on the logo are, are things that now organically occur, but they occur for the right reasons. And, and I, I think um, what that means is people look at podcast movement and they say, this is a successful event. This event's growing. Uh, this event has some buzz. This event is attracting certain types of podcasters and certain types of organizations. And, uh, why is that happening? And mm. when the question of why is that happening is brought up, right or wrong, it points to, well, who's putting this together? Mm. And when that question comes up, that's where uh, my name might come up, or that's where Dan's name definitely comes up. Uh, we're a team. You know, it, I couldn't do any of this without our team. Um, mm. There's no way I could do all this by myself. I wouldn't even try. So, uh, but now that's that's really exciting is – uh, delayed gratification, I guess, is the way to put mm. it. And not that I'm looking for gratification, but, uh, you know, the, that question's asked and people want to talk and like this podcast, they want to hear um, some of the stories. And, mm. and I think one of the big reasons for that is because um, we really made an effort in the beginning not to try to make it about us and, and try to genuinely make it about community, mm. uh, which resulted in uh, an op opportunity for true community to actually mm. grow and, and we're still learning how to grow community. You know, we got some initiatives we're putting in place this year to, to continue to foster that and grow that. And, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's a lot of stuff I just talked about. I yeah. hope I didn't make it too much, <laughs> no, but, not uh, really bad. but yeah, awesome, that's, no, no. that's, uh, that's what we believe. We believe, you know, in, in, in representing as many people and as many voices as we can. And, uh, the less we make it about ourselves, the more, we seem to, to see progress. <laughs> so, uh, we'll keep it. You know, it sounds like, it sounds like you definitely got your dad in you as well. Like just giving yeah. more than you receiving and, and just, um, you know, and, and that's, that's why it's become so successful as well is that you, you're doing this from a sort of a humble position and, uh, yeah, it's super inspiring. Seriously, that, that there's so much in there, like just to, just to unpack, you know, and, and we'll definitely be doing that after, well, after the show as well. But it's, it's really, really fascinating what you've done and, and, and really you. inspiring, you know, and, and so, and you can, and I can imagine your culture, um, as you mentioned, like would be representative of, of, of that as well, which is what well, must be a great place to be working. Are, are the other, like, uh, is there any other sort of advice for you when you sort of cultivating a community um, in the beginning uh, that you could give to our listeners or, you know, anyone trying to build a community, what, so what were some of the other sort of challenges and, and maybe some advice around that? Uh, well, we'll, we'll just kind of go back to the point mentioned, but, but to kind of dig in on, on it a little bit deeper is mm. when, when you're by yourself and, and you're wanting to do something that you feel compelled to do, the temptation is to wave your arms and maybe stand on a soapbox and, and say, look at me, look at me. And in most cases, when you're waving your arm saying, look at me, nobody will look at you. <laughs> they won't mm. really care. Uh, but what people do look at is, um, is an army. If an army marches through a town, they, they see this army. And, and so then the question could be, how, how do you create an army? And, 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 and thinking about that and, and practicing, you know, some different ideas, you know, based on that question, a couple of things that came up is, is one of them is um, what I call being the noticer is starting out by saying, okay, who, who's my, my audience or who's my, um, my target client or uh, who's the person I want to read my book or the person I want to listen to my podcast or whatever it is. And, and how can you first start by noticing them rather than saying, notice me. And that may be as simple as making a list of two or three people or five people and saying, okay, I'm going to, 
comment on their social media or I'm going to, you know, genuinely find ways to notice them, not in a contrived or a, a gimmicky way, but just a sincere way of, of noticing and, and being appreciative. And like I said, you can like their social media post or you can uh, leave a review on their podcast or you can, um, you know, comment on their blog or share their blog and tag them in a tweet or, or whatever it is, finding unique ways to notice. And what typically happens when you when you do that is I eventually start to to look and see man that that Craig guy Gareth he, these guys are really nice guys you know like <laughs> like I don't care what I don't care what the internet says about them they're good people <laughs> <laughs> and what what what's happening when you're doing that is you're creating rapport with someone and and rapport oftentimes when it's genuine and sincere rapport will yield reciprocity so you, you start out saying, uh, I'm going to notice someone else. I'm going to be sincere in that. That creates a rapport. The rapport will create reciprocity. So when it's your turn to come out with that book or launch that podcast or grow whatever idea you're wanting to grow, and you say to someone that you're you know, practicing this, this noticing uh, exercise with, you say to them, well, you know, here's something that I'm working on. In many cases, they're going to say, well, I really like this person. I want to support them. I want to tell people mm. about what they're doing and you didn't force that. Um, but they want to do it. And the reason they want to do it is because you've kind of hooked them up first, uh, mm. in a, in a genuine way. So if that's compounded over time where you're noticing people, uh, more than five people, 10, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20, uh, whatever that number is, but, but, but you're doing it again, in a sincere way. Uh, eventually enough people are raising their hand saying, we really like, this or we really like mm. this person and that's that's called the army that's called building the army so i hope i didn't take too long explaining that but i mm. i think for the person that's saying look at me instead of saying look at me saying how do i notice others how do i build that rapport with them in a sincere way because that rapport will create that reciprocity and when that's compounded reciprocity creates an army and people notice an army so if you want to get noticed you got to start by noticing others mm. But I totally love that. It's such yeah. great advice, seriously. And it's like, it's not the advice you would expect to hear. You know, someone said like, you know, this is how you build a community. Like, it's and, and not it's, a quick, quick uh, yeah, fix. Unfortunately, I wish, I wish I had a quick solution. Um, yeah, but, yeah. But, but, yeah, but, but I think the, the lesson is also nothing is actually quick. In, you know, it, it takes that <laughs> effort to, um, to grow something and, and, and yeah, wow. So, so really thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. And also I was just wondering, like, uh, you actually, uh, have had your mom on your podcast and you interviewed her recently, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I think is so cool. And, um, also so important though, you know what I mean? Like, because you, you grow up with this lady, but you don't necessarily maybe know her that well. Like, you know, I guess not, I'm not just saying you and her, but like all of us in general. So, what do you think is the say, importance of doing that and, uh, you know, for people to tell their story? <laughs> well, my mom had some stories I had not ever heard that were on that podcast. <laughs> and my, my daughter listened to that podcast. And, and in that particular podcast, my mom talked about growing up um, basically in a, you know, kind of a small poor town in Mississippi and, and they didn't have electricity or running water. They had well water and they had outhouses, wow. which is something that like most of us can't even fathom uh, <laughs> at this day and age. And so my daughter was asking questions about that. Like what's an outhouse and what is, you know, how do you, how does that even work? And, 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 you know, that was kind of funny, but yeah, that, that was a fun episode. And I, I did get a lot of feedback <laughs> from that episode. That's and awesome. what's funny is when my mom came to podcast movement this year, um, she met a number of people there and they, uh, there were a number of people said, I, I heard your episode <laughs> you know? and, and, and that was hilarious because she's, she's so new to this, like her just getting on that microphone. She didn't realize people were actually listening to that. <laughs> you know? and so for her to meet people that, you know, were, were saying, I love the story that you told about whatever. So it's just surreal for her. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was a fun thing. And I, I think, um, Maybe the takeaway is that, yeah, it's cool to uh, to interview your loved ones every now and then uh, if you have a podcast because you can share a little bit about them and kind of incorporate them into what you're doing and it makes them more excited about it as well. Kind of gives them a, a different view of the different projects that you're passionate about. So there's, there's a lot of good things that can come from it. And hey, yeah, like I've got a, a lot of interesting stories now 
documented about my mom that I never knew, mm -hmm. which created further conversation actually when I met my uncle uh, for dinner several months ago, like, you know, we, we talked about some things that were on that podcast and he, he expanded on that and said, well, here's my version of that story. And uh, it's like, Oh wow. I wish I'd recorded that. Uh, so. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. cool, man. That, but you guys have some interesting questions. I was I was not expecting this. So <laughs> well, well, well done gentlemen. Well done. Uh, well, thank you, buddy. <laughs> but you know, that it's such a great example of like, documenting your, your, your family's history and, and, you know, down the track, you get to listen to that again, you know, like it, it's, uh, mm -hmm. and your kids, your, your, your kids do, and then things like that. It's, it's really, um, really mm. wonderful that, and it's uh, something that we definitely want to, uh, it kind of sparked us in the very beginning to want to do that as well, you know, like more of that. So very, very inspiring. I, and uh, I, I did interview a gentleman, uh, unfortunately he's not, um, with us anymore. He passed and, Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when he, he passed away, I was able to reach out to his, uh, his widow and share with her the podcast episode that we recorded. And she shared that episode with, um, I guess the, the people who are mourning and, and put that out there on a special, I think like a, a Facebook page or something that they had for, for him. And, uh, goodness, man, I was so thankful to be able to give that to her because mm. she, she later came back to me and, and just explained what a source of comfort that was mm. uh, during that challenging time. And um, so that's another wonderful thing about podcasting is, is you get to capture some stories. And yeah. um, in this case, you know, this guy, unfortunately, is not around anymore. But to have that episode where he's laughing and he's, he's, he's full of joy and he's, he's talking about mm. some wonderful parts of of uh, his journey and then, then to be able to, to go back for people and, and hear that uh, and remember him in that way. That was really cool. So, yeah. Yeah. You know what we, we can, we can literally, I'm, I've got goosebumps just listening to that mm. because we totally relate <laughs> to it. We literally, yeah. one of our, one of our guests, uh, Dr. Tandy Lovu, this like real freedom fighter of South Africa, you know, uh, back in the day um, she was on our podcast and, and she, she was unfortunately, um, killed in a car accident like three oh, weeks right. ago and Sorry, um, yeah. and it was it, it's obviously seriously sad um, and the only I guess nice thing is that we managed to capture you know and we didn't even get her full story but we got like half of her story and that was just nice you know what I mean so for all those other people and and we just like all of a sudden there was these spikes in people searching and we could see it like from stats and that and it's just like in a way, it's nice that you have that um, kind of recorded for other people to to listen to, to remember. And, and Craig and I both re-listened and mm. re-watched that episode. And it was like, it was just so nice, like seeing it, you know, um, mm. and, and just remembering it. But it's still impossible to kind of believe that that lady is not here anymore. Um, so there's another good reason for doing these things. But, but well, yeah, what a gift uh, to be able to have that and, and then to be able to share that with her family and, and for yes. people that knew her. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, awesome. yeah, exactly, exactly, bud. And and bud, um, just before sort of uh, Craig asks you our, our last question, we just want to find out, like, what are you like really excited about at the moment? Uh, what have <laughs> you got like coming up in the future? And uh, also, like, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, I'm excited about an event that we're going to try in, um, in February of 2020. It's called Evolutions. It's a uh, a smaller event, uh, but we're kind of branching out and trying something new. And uh, there are people that might want to learn a little bit about that. That's at podcastmovement.com slash 2020, the year 2020. You can learn more about evolutions there. But that's uh, that's something I'm really excited about. You know, we're, we're constantly evolving. We're trying things that maybe scare us a little bit, but that's what this mm. is. We're, we're branching out. We're trying something on the, on the West Coast. And, um, you know, we're hopeful that that's going to be received well and so far so good. And um, the best way to get in touch with me outside of, of listening to the Ridiculously Human podcast, which you should listen to, uh, that should be the first place uh, that you're going to. And then the second place is if you're going to connect with me, you can uh, do that through my email. It's my name is Jared, J-A-R-E-D at podcastmovement.com. You can send me an email there and we'll connect. I'm on uh, social media as well. So you can message me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Yeah. And you also have an, yeah, you also have an amazing 
podcast uh, movement group, which has like over 20,000 people now. And that's, that's <laughs> it's really 25,000 people in 25. Yeah. yeah. That's so, not because of me. I promise you. That's, no, wow. I think it, I think it's got a lot to do with you, but you are obviously a very humble Crazy. guy, but mm. you know, you, you, ver- you nurture that, uh, that, that group every single day, you know? So the reason that it, that it grows is because of you and you, you manage it super well too, you know, like you make sure that it's the right content, that it's really valuable, that people are not sort of drifting out of their sort of lanes and then sort of promoting themselves and these sort of things. So, so really well done for that, but thank you. Yeah. That's a great group. If you're looking for a a free podcast community to check out online, uh, that's a good one. You can go on Facebook and just search for, podcast movement community and it's free there's nothing uh no obligations so you can join our group and check it out and obviously our listeners need to if they have an inkling of an of a thought that they want to start a podcast or they have a podcast they need to get over to podcast movement gareth and i had an epic time there and it's it really is valuable uh a valuable event um to to be part of that so can you tell us about next year uh, yeah, well, we also, real quick, we have a daily newsletter now, and that is um, basically on what's going on in the podcast industry. So it's great to consider uh, subscribing to that and just kind of uh, checking out, um, you know, a couple of, uh, it's basically like the, the skim. We basically have just kind of condensed uh, short uh, updates of what's going on. And, and so I hope people will check that out. Uh, but that's, sure. you can go to podcastmovement.com and you can subscribe to our daily newsletter. And then uh, two events, as you mentioned, again, you can go to podcastmovement.com slash 2020 to see the two different events. One of them is the new one. Wow. It's Evolutions. It's in LA, February 12th through the 15th. And then our big event every year, this will be our seventh year to do it, is Podcast Movement, of course. And that's in Dallas, Texas. And that will be August, I believe, 5th through the 8th of 2020. Awesome. Awesome. Brilliant. Right. So just to our last question, we always like to ask all of our guests is, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? <laughs> it means, uh, in, in, yeah, in, in embracing your many flaws and just kind of owning who you are. Uh, for me, that means being a ridiculously human is being me, but being, being unapologetically me, unless I need to apologize and then I will, uh, but, but, uh, but, but for the most part, it's, it's not being ashamed. It's, it's not being, uh, hindered. It's, it's being confident in, in who you are and who you're, uh, and what you're compelled to do. And as you learn and as you make progress toward that, uh, you, uh, not only, create something or do something that has an impact, but other people see what you do and it it makes them ask the question, well, if Gareth and Craig can do this, what can I do? And what a wonderful place to be is, is when you're in a position to uh, encourage someone else indirectly or directly to um, challenge their own status quo and and look at what they can, how can they, how can they be a ridiculously human, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and so that's why we should be ridiculously human is because it, it makes other people say, hey, what can I do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank uh, you. That's uh, well said. So, so just briefly from my side, Jared, look, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you on our show. It's, uh, it's quite, um, it's unbelievable how humble you are in, in, you know, for all the stuff that you've done. And it, it's, it's incredibly inspiring. Like some, some leaders inspire you because they've, They've got this big brash sort of way about them <laughs> and, and, and you've got a, a certain, a certain um, aspirational quality about you. That's, that's very grounded and, and, and humble. And, and we, we, we really love that um, character in people. And so, so thank you for creating what you are creating. Uh, it, it's created, it, it's given us the momentum we needed to keep this going as well. Um, and, and I'm sure there's lots of like hundreds of stories, thousands of stories that, that I'm sure we, you know, have heard from people like ours. And uh, we're just grateful for the a, a safe place to to come and explore new things and meet new people. So thanks for creating that, and uh, and thank you from our side for for sharing your your great story with us today. Hey, my pleasure. I had a blast, and I love your show, and. I hope to buy you a beer at a future podcast movement event. That would be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, but well, well, so seriously, we are totally up for Dallas next year. So we yeah. really, really, we, we just cannot wait seriously. Um, but also just a quick thank you from me, but seriously, like, um, like Craig said, it was a total honor to have you on here, you know, and, and you, you are massively humble. And, and I just think that's such a great, um, a great characteristic as well. 
And um, yeah, just the way you tell your story. But I think um, your accent, first of all, I have to just talk about it. Like, I just love it. Like there's this I mean, South African accent. No, 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 it's, no, no. It's, it's, it's <laughs> awesome. Trust me. Like um, this sort of, it's not deep South, but it's like South and you can hear it and it's got this great, it's not a twang, but it's just like, it's this great sound to it. And it's like, it's a real storytelling voice. And I just, I, I literally could have just sat here listening to you for hours. And, and, and it's not just the, the stories but it's it's the way you articulate them as well but i think you bring this this really epic energy to to the way you you tell stories and just to the way you are and um there's just like i don't know there's all these like great undertones of like of strength to you you know what i mean like it's a it's a it's such a great way of being a human you know i, I loved what you said about and uh, not being the sort of like face of, of podcast movements and doing the talks, but there's, there's this other type of strength in, in the way that you do it, you know, and it's just, uh, for me, it's really kind of like made me just think about, you know, maybe the way I am uh, or, or the way we are as a podcast and these sort of things. So, mm. so many subtle lessons in there, which I think are, are brilliant for all of us to take on board. But so, uh, um, yeah, once again, just thank you so much. Your, your story is great. What you're doing is, is fantastic. And um, it's been a total, it's, it's just been so much fun, actually. Like I really have just had so much fun talking to you and we'll totally take you up on that beer next year in Dallas. But so, cool. so thanks again. Uh, all of those, all of those points come from a spirit of harsh judgment, and I hope people understand that. So, no, I'm I'm totally kidding. No, we, we, no, these are just some different things to try and consider, and and uh, you guys are are great. So, thank you again for Thanks, uh, being so hospitable and allowing me to be here. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Jared. Cool. Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.